Um, okay, yeah, looks like all our panelists are here. This is great, and students keep coming in. So uh, welcome, welcome to the ITAM employer panel. Um, this is a joint effort between ITAM and Career Services, and this is our third one this year. So um, yeah, they've all been uh, great feedback from students, and I hear back from students later, just uh, what are the great information that they learn. So uh, I, hey, I do want to start real fast and just talk about career services because some of the students here maybe have never met me, don't even know that career services exist. And of course, with COVID, campuses have been really different. Um, so what I want to say is that, uh, so I'm a career counselor and I'm here to help you with anything career related. So especially if you start to get some really excited ideas about things you want to start applying for after this ITAM panel. Um, so I'm a great person to check in with. So how you access our services right now is if you just Google CWU, stand for Central Washington University, Career Services, it's gonna take you to our homepage. And on our homepage, there's a book online appointment and you just click on that and you'll have a menu of counselors. Um, so what I would say for ITAM, the main counselors are myself, Steve Lang and uh, Jesse Allen. So if you are in the Ellensburg service um, campus, probably Jesse Allen. If you're on the west side, it's going to be, or online, it's going to be Steve or I. But if you make an appointment with whichever, it doesn't matter. This right now online world, as long as you make it to one of us, uh, that's great. We really, we won't kick you out if we find out, oh, you're an Ellensburg student and you, you made an appointment with me. I'm, I'll just say welcome. I'm really just happy that you... Uh, made appointment for our services. So with that being said, um, I think Luke, do you want to say anything about the ITAM department? And then we can get on to the best part. Yeah, of the yeah I'll just give a quick, quick, some, you know, synopsis of ITAM real fast. And I want to say too, thanks for doing this, everybody. And um, also, I'm glad we're recording these. I have students asking for these recordings. I have, I have a student right now who wanted to be on today, but he's serving in the military. He's actually a prospective student, not even in the program yet wants to come in and do project management with us. And he said, it's four in the morning, my time over in Iraq or wherever he's at, Afghanistan, wow. he couldn't tell me, but he's like, I wanna see this, but I don't think I can get away for the time. Can I get the recording? So, so this is really important, I think, for students to know that they go on afterwards and get access to these recordings and look at this information. This, they want this, they're hungry for this information. So thank you all for, for doing this. Um, but ITAM department, is we call it IT management, it's information technology and administrative management, uh, but that's a fancy name, but it encompasses things like cybersecurity, data innovation, administration. Um, we have our project manager folks, and we'll be talking a lot about administrative management and project management here tonight, um, as well as our IT major, which is also getting a lot of um, updates in things like artificial intelligence, cloud computing, and some of those hotter areas that are emerging areas of tech, like we talked about on our last panel. So um, that's a little bit about ITAM, but I'm gonna turn it back over to Meredy and let the experts talk about the specific technology. Thank you guys. Great, well, I'd like to kick off the panel by hearing from each of the panelists. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit about what you do and maybe a little bit about your career journey, how you got there. Because a lot of these students, right, they're recent graduates or you know, about to graduate or you know, somewhere in their program. And so it's nice to just hear about your journey too. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and start with Corey because he just happens to be the first square on my uh, visual. So, <laughs> um, so Corey is a client services partner for Slalom. And I'm afraid that I'm not gonna pronounce your last name properly. So. Perhaps you can teach me. <laughs> yeah, it is Öztubukçu. <clears throat> yeah, so Turkish. Um, in fact, um, so let me tell you guys a little bit about my journey and then what I do. Um, so um, client service partner, it's basically an account manager. Uh, it's a pretty large um, uh, account. We are a consulting company. And then we have accounts. And then if you have a pretty large account, and uh, this happened to be pretty large uh, global account for us, um, you have a team of people manage that relationship. And I'm leading a team uh, to manage that. So uh, in terms of journey, uh, I'm an uh, electronics engineer. Uh, graduated you know, 30 years ago. <laughs> 
And, uh, you know, after maybe about uh, two years of engineering with uh, Alcatel, let's say a telco company in Europe, um, I moved into computers because I, that was my hobby. And I start, uh, you know, I found a job in, uh, interestingly enough, Tripoli, Libya. Uh, this is, uh, you know, late 80s uh, and uh, work in the IT department of an international company. Then I was bored. I said, I, I better get an MBA. And then I had a little bit of money. I'm like, okay, I'll find a school in the United States. And I came to US, uh, University of Arkansas, got my MBA there, and then uh, found a job uh, on the side while I was doing that. Then I was bored again. And I'm like, now I have an MBA. I think I can be a consultant. I moved into consulting and I moved up to Seattle in 1995. Uh, then very quickly, I started up my own company in 1996, consulting company. Uh, it was successful uh, at its peak. I think it was about 125 people. Then uh, EMC purchased us. Then I kind of moved around and then now I'm with Slal. I don't know if I did a good job, but that's kind of a, a, um, a, a quick journey. You did a great job. I have all these questions in my mind now, but uh, I'll wait. I'll wait and let the students ask them too. So, um, okay. So the next, uh, let's see. Next, we have Anthony Michalossi. Am I saying that right? Real close, Mary. Okay. Really, really <laughs> close. It's it's Michalossi, and hopefully there's not too much background noise coming in. Um, my wife is on the Peloton. It's new. And uh, she loves that thing. So I hope that it's not getting too loud. I told her to keep it down. So hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, so my, yeah, a little about my journey. I mean, currently, um, let's see, I've been in services consulting, whether it's been technology or management and strategy consulting for about the last 12 years. Um, I think I will just kind of talk about my journey there versus uh, starting from, you know, uh, be prior to that in, in, in the professional kind of my professional realm. But um, I really got my first taste of technology coming out of the real estate industry in 2008, which if anyone remembers 2008 was a, a bit of a crazy time to be in real estate and mortgage. Um, and I started with a company called Concur. And there was not very many of us in 2008. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard of Concur. They were one of the first software as a service platforms automating travel and expense software, um, and then providing a ton of other bells and whistles around data and analytics and negotiating with vendors and helping enterprises keep that spend and negotiate different uh, rates and structures with those vendors that all that spend would go through. Um, so that's how I got my taste of technology back in 2008. From there, um, where I sold product, uh, and my journey has always been about kind of account management, sales leadership, or individual kind of contributor um, sales, sales, sales roles. Um, from there, I moved to, to Microsoft Consulting Services, um, where I was able to learn how to kind of sell the services side of technology and strategy, which is definitely a, a bit of a pivot and a transition, but also very fascinating um, because the services world, and Karai will probably echo this more and more, and same with Michael, you are exposed to a ton of different technology products and a ton of different business and technology transformation. So there's never a boring day because you could be working in with a different tech or a different client at any, you know, any given time. Um, so after them, I got my taste of, of the services world in Microsoft, I then um, let that kind of decided that's where I was gonna stay. And since, since the Microsoft consulting days have been with two other consulting firms over the last 10 years. Um, uh, and, and currently where I'm at with West Monroe, um, we really focus on in four, four or five core industries. And that's how we organize our clients. Um, and I could, tell, I could tell everyone more about the ins and outs of that later um, as we get into different questions, but um, yeah, I think that's a little bit about my journey, how I got into tech and consulting and strategy consulting, and hopefully, hopefully that makes, makes sense. Yeah, thank you, Anthony. Um, and a student had a great question. They were asking um, about the employers, and so I did post um, names of the panelists, um, and titles, employers, things like that. So um, looks next on the square, looks like we have Michael Thorne. 
you tell us a little bit about your company, what your career journey? Absolutely. Um, so I have been in technology recruiting primarily. Um, I've recruited for several industries and, and, and different functions over the years, but technology has been the bulk of it. Uh, since 97, I guess. Um, so kind of racking up the years in it. Um, I've gone from agency doing, you know, just contract staffing early on to building out development teams that were building product on behalf of a customer. Um, I've been on the corporate side. I, I was at Microsoft. Um, I've, and then went out to, went back to agency and was with a company called Ascentium here locally that was, they're now Smith. They've been through several iterations and lots of uh, stories, uh, interesting stories that are best over beers. But um, well, I was employee number 55 and left at around 600. Um, so quite a bit of growth and, and learned a heck of a lot there. Went out with five of my um, co-workers at, at, uh, at Ascentium and started a company called Salient 6, uh, which we also did project-based uh, consulting. Um, from there, I missed being, we kind of got narrow in our focus on a specific product that didn't really bring me joy um, after a while, which is a bad place to be, um, being a partner in a company, not really digging what you're doing. So I went back out into talent acquisition and recruitment, which is really, I, I love it because of the people. You're just interacting with so many types of people at all levels. And, and if you're working on a, like now, Talent Network is my company and I work on behalf of my customers. They hire me to find specific people in specific roles. And for me, the interest there is just, you know, not only the people, but I'm learning about people's business. Why do they need this person and understand the model understand, you know, the employee experience there and really why does someone want to leave their VP job over here to take a job with you? Um, just understanding that whole thing and being able to, to speak to it is, it's a lot of fun. It, it's, I'm always learning. Um, but again, it, mostly technology, though I've done, you know, marketing and design and user experience and sales um, lots of different types of roles, but um, I always find myself in and around technology and a ton of management consulting. Um, I've done that with, with several different companies. Uh, West Monroe, um, also with um, uh, BCG, Boston Consulting Group, was a big client of mine for years. But um, yeah, that's me. That's what I do. Well, you have us very intrigued when you say you have stories that can only be heard over beer. Hmm. Yeah. No, How do we get to him to tell them? I'm not, I don't know. Anyway. I, okay. I'll give you, I'll give you a couple um, little tidbits. Um, I know of a couple, I can't tell that. Um, <laughs> nah, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> okay. Well, guys, we have to keep working on them. Um, <laughs> So, Laura Williamson, we'd love to hear a little bit about your career journey and what you're doing now. Thanks, Meredy. Can you hear me? I'm in this box. I don't know where I'm appearing on your screens, but here I am. <laughs> yeah, thank you for uh, inviting me. My name is Dr. Laura Williamson. I'm a lecturer uh, with Central Washington University. And um, gosh, well, I've been in higher education uh, off and on for about 30 years now. Uh, my private sector work was with L3 Corporation. We were responsible for manufacturing and selling those imaging systems that are on unmanned air vehicles that fly all around the world. I'm sure you're familiar with those. I'd say that's probably the coolest job I had was being on a helicopter with the uh, United States Air Force flying out over the water in Miami trying to, to teach their operators how to use this imaging million dollar imaging system. I definitely miss that cool factor of that job. Um, 
So yeah, I've worked with the, the Air Force, Air National Guard, L3, uh, Data IO. I've had positions of project manager, program manager, portfolio manager. I've been associate dean. I've been a dissertation chair. Uh, I think my first job was a tech writer. Um, I've worked for six universities. So yeah, I've got a lot of um, experience and credentials to bring to the ITAM department, which I love. And uh, I want to just first off, uh, or secondly, I guess, thank um, Meredy for the opportunity to be here and Luke for inviting me and everyone else in the ITAM department and just welcome any student who is struggling. These are very difficult times and you're in the right place where you're definitely here for you. Thanks. Those are inspiring words. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll kick off the first question, but students can uh, turn off the turn on their camera and, and mic and um, ask questions. You can submit questions in the chat, um, however you'd like. So, but I'll just start it off so students can start typing their questions in. So I um, was given a list of questions from the ITAM graduate students. And actually, these list of questions were originally like four pages. Okay, so they had a lot of questions for this panel. But um, fortunately, there were some themes that came up. Um, so I'll try to um, find the questions that a lot of them asked. Um, but one that gets asked a lot uh, in, in, this, um, in these lists, and also just amongst when I'm working with students as a career counselor, they ask a lot about what advice would you have for a current student and what kind of skills should they be obtaining now um, to be, um, you know, to be ready for the ITM job market when they graduate? And, and any, and actually I, I encourage all to, you know, would love to hear from all of you about this, so. You want me to go first, maybe? <clears throat> um, I'm sure uh, Mike has a more educated answer to this one because that's his, his job, right? He's closer. But as a person who probably interviewed hundreds of people in the last you know, 20 years, I, in our industry, when I'm looking for a new graduate, the number one thing that I, I look for is the self-confidence and can-do attitude. Right, because my, my assumption is, look, schools do a great job, right? Teaching a lot of uh, uh, hard skills as well as soft skills. But in terms of hard skills, I assume that they don't know anything, right? So even if they don't know anything, would I hire this person, right? Um, in that approach, I care about those, um, um, kind of skills, soft skills that, hey, you know what? If someone is willing to learn, someone has the positive attitude and self-confidence that is critical, then that person can be a good professional. Everything else they can learn. Um, so that is, that is my short answer. There are hard skills, obviously, depends on the company that they're applying. It would be good to have those uh, hard skills. If they're applying to a security department uh, within a company, having those cybersecurity background, you know, at least understanding, general understanding of the concepts and ability to, to um, uh, use the tools that's available is an important skill set. But what I say is, you know, that attitude and the confidence is the most important. Yeah, that's that's great. I'd maybe just add a couple things to, to that. And I, I interview a lot of salespeople and account managers, less on the delivery side. But one thing I see a lot, and Karai did, did nail it in terms of the confidence and the attitude and just wanting to get out there and make things happen, is that in this market, when I talk about Washington, Seattle, the, the, you know, the war for talent is, is often a term that you'll hear amongst a lot of different enterprise and mid-sized companies because there are there's so many great companies that we have in, in this area and there's just not enough talent typically. 
um, to, to go around. So there's a continual battle for good people. And that starts with the good people coming out of ITAM and other universities, organizations like you guys are, are in right now. So where, where, where I'm going with that is just know that most companies, um, they, you know, if you have an idea or if you're interested in where you could see applying what you've learned at CW, CWU ITAM and where you could see it being applicable or where you're interested in working, don't wait till you're done with, with school. There's programs where you can get involved earlier, whether you know it's internships or just informationals. There's all kinds of programs, including ones that we have, and I'm sure Karai has and Michael has and other big companies where you can get involved earlier and have a lead in to potentially right when you come out of school, you've got some good options and some good offers on the table. So my, my key piece of advice is you don't need to wait till you're done. There's so much going on out there right now for you to get involved, in, get involved with while you're uh, attending education that I would recommend everybody figure out what that looks like or at least have a couple, couple um, up your sleeve for, for areas of interest. For me, the things that I look for most, I, and and for especially for people coming, you know, right out of university, it's a, it's there's it's poise, it is communications, and it is curiosity. Um, poise, just and that goes back to the confidence and just being comfortable in your skin and uh, knowing what you know, but honest about what you don't, and being able to to communicate. Um, in a, in a, in a fashion that's, you know, quasi professional, it doesn't mean you have to be, uh, stuffy or not be yourself, but just being able to articulate yourself and your ideas and your passions. Um, and the, the curiosity piece is especially coming out of, of school where you may not have any real world experience yet. You may not have the depth in a particular area that they're looking for, but if you can demonstrate that you have taken a curiosity and followed that down a path and built some knowledge around a certain area, and, and obviously it helps if it's somewhere around technology or somewhere even tangential to what you're looking at, um, just to demonstrate that, hey, I can learn anything. You put it in front of me. If I'm excited about it, I'm going to learn everything there is to know. Um, and that just shows some initiative, um, obviously some, some intellect. But, um, you know, if you can put all that together and communicate it effectively in an interview, um, yeah, that's good. I would, I would hire you. Well, I'd like to take a crack at this one, too. This is Laura in this box. I, um, I always tell my students to create a map, go to the job that you want, look at the requirements, copy the requirements into a table. And that's your first column. The second column is the classes you've taken. You should be able to look at every single syllabus that you have. If you didn't keep those, you can certainly still get them on the CWU website. And you can pull outcomes out. You can list in there, oh, I know what a, I did a RACI chart. I did a PERT chart. I did a Gantt chart. I know how to do all these things. List those things. Then have a third column. And whoever wrote the sales class, the selling class that we offer in ITAM is so fantastic. I love that class so much. Because why? Luke already knows what I'm going to say. So there's the feature. You're a feature. And then there's the benefit of you? Why should I hire you? What's good about the fact that you know how to do a racy chart and you know how to change that? You know how to do project plans? Well, because you know, there's, there's the benefit of hiring someone who knows how to do all those things. I can think on my feet. I can collaborate well with others. I know the language of the business that, you're, that this industry is in. So that should go in your uh, third column. Great. Thank you, Laura. So uh, students, you're welcome to throw some questions in the chat. So I'll just keep going down my list until we get a question in there or uh, if anybody else wants to ask. Um, so students often ask about graduate to graduate school or not to graduate school and when. 
Um, so sometimes I think it's just scary to go out there and they find themselves, oh, I'm just gonna jump into graduate school. Um, where would you suggest and when and why um, should a student go to graduate school? Should I go first again? I think let's use that order. Um, I don't think that there is an easy answer to that. Uh, so I'll try to give some practical answers. Um, and I would love to maybe get some follow on questions from uh, from the students, what they are thinking. Um, my take on that is if it, I am against going into the graduate school right after uh, your undergrad for a few reasons. One, um, uh, it, it, I think real job experience somewhere along the way is extremely important. And um, getting that between your you know, undergrad and uh, graduate school, uh, I think makes you much smarter. You may decide to delay it. You may decide to change you know, what your master's or you know, the, uh, you know, graduate is gonna be. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot goes into, into that decision. So if you have the ability to find a job after your graduation that is in your field and the field that you care, my recommendation is start there. Now, you have to be careful though, if you're happy with your job, which is awesome, and if you feel like that's a dream job for you and that's awesome, do not give up your kind of dreams because the graduate program is extremely important to elevate yourself. So what you gotta do if, uh, again, I did this thing and it helped me quite a bit, don't you know, stop your work, don't quit your work, right? Go to, um, to the, the night classes, get your uh, graduate degree while you're working. It's a lot of work, but guess what? You guys are young. That's, that's when you invest you know, you know, uh, into your career, put the necessary effort, uh, you are advancing your career while you're actually allowing yourself to um, uh, leapfrog in your career down the road with kind of knowing exactly what to get out of the master's program at that point. Thank you. Do, do any other panelists want to add to that? Their view on when to go to graduate school or why? I'll um, I'll jump in on that, and and it's it's I may just be restating some of what Cora I said, but it it really is you know give yourself a chance to explore what you think you want to uh, go deep into in the in the real world before you actually make that commitment. Uh, you may find that you want to do something completely different or a different direction within that big, broad brushstroke. But um, yeah, just give it some time going straight in. And there are some people that know, you know, at an early age exactly what they want to be doing. But when you're talking about technology, um, it's kind of hard to, to, to make that early statement and not have it change on you just because of the shifting, shifting sands um, of the landscape, but yeah, pretty much what Cora said. <laughs> There's actually a follow-up question. I think about the uh, uh, work-life balance. Oh yeah, so I didn't, did anybody else want to add to the last question or should we move on to, are we okay to move on? I just wanted to add really quickly, this is Laura, that you know, I think graduate degrees, and there's certainly a lot of professional credentialing that is available, certificates are all very useful. They should serve a purpose, like our other panelists have already said, I wouldn't do it just to do it, and I don't think a student would do that. But if a student comes in with a certain skill set, and they want to go into a different industry, it's a great way to leverage and, and shoot off into that other industry, and it's, it's a less maybe not graduate school, but a credential of some sort can get you through the door in, um, in a different area. Great, thanks, Laura. So Courtney asked a great two-part question. How do you manage your work-life balance 
when and how did you have to compromise to achieve your goals? Isn't that a million dollar uh, question? Um, I, I don't think that I have the right answer, but I have an answer. So let me give you my answer. Um, I think we all need to make those decisions based on who we are and what we wanna do, right, in life. And each of us have a different perspective in life. Um, my perspective is work hard and you know, always work hard. It just, you know, especially when you're young, you, 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 what you are contributing in, into your, your knowledge base, your career, um, gives you a significant um, leverage on the later part of your career, right? What you achieved in the first five years, it, you know, is more important than what you achieve in the last five years of your career. So um, my recommendation, again, I give the same recommendation to my kids. Uh, forget about everything else, just, just double down, triple down. If you need to work at two jobs, um, it's fine. I did that thing. So it's not like, hey, this guy is fine right now. He's making good money, so he can speak. No, I mean, I, I worked on three jobs uh, and, and, uh, uh, and then go to school. I know it's very difficult. I was hating life during that five-year period. Um, but then, you know, you get to a point that it's like, hey, you know what? It is easy now. It's a somewhat downhill. Uh, so uh, that would be my recommendation. Um, but then how do you, and then there are other important things in life, right? Career is not everything, right? And that's what I say, it's really personal. And, you know, um, yeah, I, I know I'm not doing a good job, but that one is is a, a tough question. It is, yeah, and I can add, a, I think I'd, I'd like to add a little bit on that one. Um, I think, it all comes down to what your goals are. And this is a bit of a perspective and philosophical, you know, conversation with what, 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 what are your goals, right? I mean, what goals do you have, whether it's personally, professionally with family and, and how do you prioritize those? And I think it's going to be probably a little bit different for everyone. The one thing I will agree on uh, with, with Karai is that the first five years, the, the, when you first hunker into that new career or, you know, where you, want to get to, you know, you're probably not going to get that dream job or that, that dream salary or where you want to be right when you get into it, but it, it is attainable. And once you get to, once you get the right experience, um, that work-life balance becomes much better and a much easier, uh, I think, place to kind of say, okay, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to coach, I'm going to coach my kids and, that's going to be, you know, four o'clock, two, three days a week. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to be cutting out of work early. And you've gotten to that point where you can kind of do that, or maybe it's some other hobby or whatever. But I will say, even especially right now, one thing I really appreciate about West Monroe uh, that I, who I work with is, I don't know if students are feeling the same, but in the professional industry, I'm busier since COVID in terms of back-to-back -back meetings than I was before, because there are, it is one meeting after the next, after the next, after the next, and it's it's crazy. And I'm, I'm grateful for it and for the job, but it's just, it's incredible how many more meetings I have uh, because it's all at home and they're right after one after the other. So one of the things West Monroe does is they're saying, hey, look, we're seeing a lot of fatigue. We're seeing a lot of people burn out. We want you to take more time off. We want you to do more things with your family. So my only point is, is, don't kill yourself with work so much that you forget about all the other important stuff that it is to keep balanced and healthy while you're doing your job. Because if you do get burnt out, you're going to be no good to anyone. Um, and I've seen it firsthand and I've, I've experienced it. So the work-life balance is huge. Never forget about it. I believe in the first five years, like Karai said, work hard, you need to, but there, there needs to be a balance always. And that's going to make you do your job better. Um, and, and I truly, truly believe that. Okay, Michael, we have to hear from you because you're in the car right now and your kid is playing soccer. So I have to think that you know something about how to do the work-life balance. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just thankful that this call was not on uh, over my uh, other son who I would be actually be on the field coaching. 
Um, so yes, no, it's you just, the other guys have said it, it's, it's a priorities thing. Um, and you know, really in interest of, of, of moving yourself forward, what direction do you want to go? What is it that you are really trying to accomplish? If you're, you know, hell bent on being at the very top of your profession, you're going to have to sacrifice a lot. Um, and you know, as far as, as far as, as managing your, your work life and everything else, while you're trying to get that advanced degree, um, you're only going to do it once. Right. So, and you, you know, yes, you will have to make some sacrifices during that time, but once you're done and, and like Cora said, working three jobs and going to school, everything else is going to seem easier. So you can work 10, 12 hours a day, um, you know, and, and still figure out how to balance your life because you're not going to school or, you know, and again, it just comes back to what your priorities are. And, and that's where you pour your, your passion and your energy. Um, so, yeah, but yes, family is obviously really important to me. <laughs> Laura, did you want to add anything? Uh, oh, yes, of course. I'm a professor. We always have something to add to everything. <laughs> There's no stopping us. Uh, thank you, though. Yeah, I just, yeah, I'm, I'm sensitive to the notion that, um, you know, people are going through a lot. My students are going through a lot faculty are going through a lot, staff are going through a lot. It's a, it's a global pandemic. I always, I said that to my class last week. You are handling it though, is what's true. You are actually handling it. We are all handling it. And, you know, in my field in project management, what I say is you will feel overwhelmed. You will be in meetings where you do not know the answer. You will know many answers but you will not know every answer and that is normal. Your job is to take care of yourself better than you're taking care of that project. Make sure you're, you know, I sound like a, like a personal coach or something, but this is what I say to them. Please drink water, please eat lunch, walk away from your computer. Everyone's okay. Like it's not, it's okay. Um, we have to more than ever mix at it. I'm in 10 times, sometimes 10 Zoom meetings a day. It's just insane. So I have to get up and walk away and I have to have tea and I have to walk around the lake I live near and just like that doesn't, I don't think that changes when you graduate though. It's just more true. So developing a practice now as a student um, is a good time to build that muscle. Thank you. Um, we have a couple questions in um, in the chat box. I don't know if there's any particular that some panelists want to take an answer, maybe that are a little more near and dear to them. Yeah, I mean, I, I would like to say a few things about, um, I think, um, I, two of those, right? One of them, I believe there's a question about uh, being a paramedic for 12 years and having difficulty uh, maybe um, switching the uh, uh, careers. Um, obviously, you know, I don't know the specifics, but in my opinion, uh, being a paramedic is an outstanding background. Um, you know, that is a, 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 a job that requires a significant responsibility. Um, nobody should take that uh, lightly. And um, and then, you know, doesn't matter, you know, what your next career is, you should be able to, you know, proudly push that thing as a qualification. And, and if, if for some reason you are having difficulty for those companies, just not understanding that or valuing that, I think you're applying to wrong companies. So don't feel, don't feel like you have a disadvantage, you have actually an advantage. So make sure you, you press on it. Uh, that will be my, my two cents. Um, and then there was one more that I was gonna actually say something, but um, 
Oh, the the um, the item versus MBA. Um, look, every organization, including the utilities, they are definitely they have to move to become technology companies. That's where the world is going. Doesn't matter what your business is, you have to be a technology uh, company. You have to be a digital company. So ITEM program provides you that um, nice mixture of the skill sets and uh, capabilities that 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 you need to have to make that transformation. Uh, so my recommendation is ITEM would give you a much bigger. Um, uh, I think perspective, and that helps you way more than I believe MBA would. I'll jump in real quick too, because I have an MBA. So as somebody that has one and works for ITEM, I'll, I'll actually agree with Cor Corey there because one of the things with the MBA, it's more of a general degree um, and it's great and they teach you to think systematically, but I think the person, I think it was Jason or somebody in here kind of answered their own question or um, Duncan, um, the, Corey nailed it. The, the industries are all emerging, are going technology and they're understanding how technology is being used. So that's really the key is that if they would have had the ITAM master's degree when I was, you know, years and years ago when I did my MBA, I, I probably would have done the same. I would have done the ITAM degree. Uh, back in the day, it was usually the, like a hardcore computer science programming degree or an MBA. Those were your choices. Now the world's a lot more you know, we have, we have a lot more choices. There's a lot more um, areas of it. And so, so that's something that I would consider, but I agree with Corey a lot. And I, as someone who has an MBA, I highly recommend the focus of what ITAM offers for a graduate program. So. Perfect. Yeah, think, Thank you. Yeah. I think just for, to, to Jory, hopefully I'm pronouncing the name correct, just to add on. And I'm definitely uh, curious to hear Michael's thoughts on this because um, the, you know, presenting yourself and understanding how to be more palatable or to be more attractive to different companies and how to position all that. Michael's an artist when it comes to that stuff and he's going to, he's going to get into it. But I think two things that I would say for Jory are you, you've got, um, you've kind of got some healthcare background, right. Um, or kind of more on the system side versus like the payer side. Um, and you're getting into, you're getting the ITAM stuff going and administrative and management. So there's a lot of, whether it's services industries like where Karai and I work or industry clients like Providence St. Joseph Health or Seattle Children's, there's a lot of places that will love the blend of the two backgrounds, in my opinion, from what I've seen and from how we at West Monroe kind of go about our business. We like the blend or the multidisciplinary skill set as a prerequisite for, for how we hire and how we go in and help clients and help customers. And they're looking for the same thing. So I will say, you know, maybe you focus more on, you know, the administrative management in the, in the healthcare industry, or maybe you want to get out of it completely and go something different, but that's a natural transition that I see. Secondly, and this is just kind of shooting you straight. Um, it's, and you know how competitive it, it is out there in the job market. It's, it's nuts. Even right now, it's nuts. So if you are able to network and leverage your network and relationships, um, you got to do it. If you know somebody at the company you're interviewing for, there is always a referral portal, portal and a referral network that they can fast track you and get you a better look than if you're just going in blind. And it's, it's just... Sometimes you have to, sometimes you, you have somebody that you know and you can network, but if you can network and go into with somebody you know, or it's a first or second degree connection with that company, it does help tremendously getting into a company right now. So those are the two that I would, I would offer is some advice that I see out there. I totally agree with that last point. Um, not that I disagree with the you know, previous points, but um, the network is the key. Uh, applications often don't work. Unfortunately, it's a black hole. Um, I hate uh, I hate having to speak on behalf of recruiters out there everywhere. But you know, even though the job market is good and there is talent short, there are there are lots of people that you know apply for the wrong jobs or 
they just going about the job search is a very hard thing to do. Um, and you really have to, 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 if you've got a network within a company, um, just anyone that, you know, it's always better to, to go that route. Um, as far as, you know, making the career change, you want to have a really good story for what is motivating you to make this career change. And also what it is you leveraged from that experience. Um, I can't imagine a more um, stressful and problem solving and thinking on your feet. And that, that applies, like just those qualities and experience will apply to anything. Um, so being able to, to you know, articulate what it is you, you, you learn from it, um, you know, maybe why you don't want to do that anymore and why you want to go into the direction that you do. Um, I think that's the hardest part for people making a, a career transition is being able to speak to those things. And, you know, honestly, obviously you also, you have to have that opportunity to have a conversation about first, right. Um, then that's where that kind of networking in, in goes in you do have to be realistic about the level of a position that you're going to go into in a brand new career. Um, so make sure you're shooting at the right level and being willing to work your way into what you really want to do. Yeah. So many good questions and, and <laughs> responses. Wow. Um, I, I just want to be sensitive that, you know, we're, we're, getting toward the later portion of, of our time. So I want to be sensitive to that, but there's still a lot of great questions and so many great uh, points you have all brought up. And I, I want to ask a question real quick. I'm going to slip in here, but I think this is something that a theme that I'm seeing in the chat. If, if I can take that Liberty um, with having such good panelists, like all of you on here, and then particularly with regard to Anthony and Michael, having access to basically hiring experts in the technology field in the Seattle market. I, you know, I can't be on here and not ask this question, but sort of are tools like resumes and LinkedIn and things like that still being used, you know, in, for job searches? I think, I think one of the things we're trying to students are trying to get their mind around is how do they get the process going? How do they get in the door? And Anthony, you brought up a really great point about leveraging your own network which totally hit home for me. I mean, that's so true. When I was a recruiter, I remember that exactly. But how have things changed? Are those tools still what people are using? What, what are people using now to sort of get themselves into the, the process and being, being able to get in the door? Because I think that's, that's the first step that some of our students are trying to figure out. Yeah. Michael, you want to start that? Yeah, I'll take it. Um, I think resume and your LinkedIn profile are pretty much the same thing. If you're in, like I see in a lot of consultancies, uh, people that have been consulting for a long time, you've got NDA stuff that you can't, you know, in some contracts, you can't even mention the customer name that you're working with. So you'll see a lot of people that have been in consulting for a long time and, you know, they may just say, uh, you know, big uh, software company based in Redmond where you can, you know, infer what they're, what they're going at. But Otherwise, for if it's not that situation, put everything in your LinkedIn profile so that people that are doing searches, uh, recruiters that are doing searches, they can actually see as much context as they can before they ever get on the phone with you. So, um, but always having a resume ready is, is also good because some people, like a lot of uh, applicant tracking systems, which is a whole nother can of worms. Um, a lot of applicant tracking systems need a resume. They won't let you apply through LinkedIn or, and also on that point with the resume, it's gotta be clean, um, with no special characters and no, um, italics. And like, you've got to have just a, a plain text resume for the applicant tracking systems, or a lot of times they'll boot you out. Hmm. Um, it's, it's. Yeah, I've got a, lots of opinions on that, but um, yeah, that's that's my opinion on that. <laughs> yeah, I love the 
I, I don't know, Karai or Laura, do, did you guys want to jump in on that one too? Um, well, I mean, I, I, I think the question is, yeah, I mean, Mike, Michael already responded from the, the recruiting perspective. I think he knows better than us, but, you know, from the, I think the second part of that question, maybe how do you build your network? How do you get in there? Right. Um, uh, you know, it is not easy when you are at the beginning of your career, but start somewhere, right? So do you know anyone? Do you like your family members? It really doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be the network that is specifically about uh, your dream job or something. Like your friends at school is your network. That's how you're gonna build it. It doesn't happen overnight. There's no easy way of doing this, but uh, make sure you put yourself out there. I think that is the most important one. Um, you never, and don't do that thing for, um, I think, um, just expecting that there's gonna be a benefit, you know, tomorrow or a year from now. You may have a network and then, you know, you may never use that person or you may need their help, you know, 30 years down the road. Uh, but just continue building it. Uh, there's no good answer there, uh, but start with, you know, like reach out to us. We are your network, right? Just say, hey, I, you know, I really like what you said there, like to connect over uh, LinkedIn, right? Just, just always think about expanding your network. Um, that's how you're going to find your second job. Maybe not your first job, but if you do your job, if you build your network properly, you should never apply for a job after your first job. They will call you or somebody is going to say, hey, uh, you can make more money here. Your network is going to help you to go through your career after your first job. Absolutely. On, on the last panel, Judy Merkin had mentioned to the students, wow, she's like, I'm looking at my LinkedIn and how come none of you are connecting with me yet? So she was mm -hmm. giving me a little prompt to get everybody started in the networking process. Yeah, I had that same thought. While everyone is talking, I'm connecting on LinkedIn with everyone who's talking. And um, I remember Judy saying that, and that was brilliant. There's there's no reason, I say this to my students as well, why are we not connected? You need to be reaching out to me. I'm a member of multiple organizations. I will bring you with me to conferences. Like you're just are living amongst your network right now. And so don't be shy. To give you a, a quick example, right? The reason that I'm in this panel, is because five years ago, one of the professor's husband, which used to work for me, invited me to, to, to the advisory board. Um, you know, uh, Anthony here, right? We were sitting on the, the board and one day I had an opportunity. I, I remember that he was working for one of our competitors, but I needed someone else. I called Anthony, I say, hey, we have a work here. Let's come in and then we'll, we'll win an RFP, which even won the RFP. Then I got that back from him after I joined Slalom. <laughs> but yeah, again, I mean, look at, my, you know, yeah, yeah, and then now he's working for one of my ex-employees, right? You still work for Brian, I believe. Right, Anthony. Right, and then you know, Mike. You know, we have we have a lot of kind of uh, people that we know together. So even us here, we have a network, and I know where my network is. That is critical. No question. There's a couple other really great questions, and I know we got five minutes. Um, COVID nineteen. How has it changed? the industries that we serve or the lasting effects. I think that that's a great one. Um, and there's been a lot on that. Um, I guess if, if, if I was to start, what I will say is the, the digital capabilities, this is a, kind of an obvious one, but it might not be obvious for some people that aren't living and breathing it every day, but the digital capabilities that these enterprise organizations were working towards or to, um, network access and you know master data management and security and um, even just like uh, infrastructure and setup for people to work at home simple stuff it has all been accelerated um, 
to a, you know, to the nth degree in the last, you know, 10 to 12 months. So people, companies that were kind of getting there um, are really setting themselves up so that if something like this happens again, the transition for everyone to work from home with all the tools and the ability to do what they need to do anywhere and on the spot. And that goes, that, that those changes include people, process and technology, right? It's not just technology. All those things are changing on how, on how they go through it. Um, so I think the lasting effects are, are really going to be probably that the, the digital capabilities more than anything else, uh, as well as how the operations support it. And I could probably talk about this for another 40 minutes, but I want to give some other people to, I want to give some other people a chance to talk about it too. Um, Cause I think it's a great question and certainly one that is keeping, you know, firms like my firm and probably cry also, cause we are, I wouldn't say we're competition, but we're close. Um, uh, it's keeping it's keeping us busy like it's keep, keeping us you know gainfully employed in terms of all these industries t-mobile for example and other companies that i work with they're coming they need help they need a ton of help and there are a ton of areas that we're we're helping them with because of what COVID has accelerated in that in that regard so i'll i'll, I'll pause there and let some of the other panelists jump into yeah that is a that's a great question and i think especially in consulting, you see it probably as much or more than any other industry. So Anthony talks about being in 10, you know, back-to-back -back Zoom meetings. Um, it used to be there'd be maybe four meetings in a day it was probably a pretty busy day because you'd have to drive to them, fly to them, whatever. You were out and about. And what, they're, what we're seeing is a heck of a lot of productivity um, for people being at home, maybe not in Anthony's case, but um, people people are getting things done. And companies that had the, the attitude of, no, we don't work from home. Um, we don't have that kind of flexibility. You're taking a job with us and you're going to be in our walls for 40, 50 hours a week. I think a lot of that is going to change permanently. There are definitely going to be some that, that will go back. But you, I've got a... Um, a friend who is manages all of the uh, corporate side of, of Microsoft on buildings and, you know, all the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the facilities and all that stuff. And like, they're, they don't know really when they're going back. And so, you know, and people are moving all over the place and still doing their jobs. And so, you're going to see big, big shifts in the, in the core attitudes of, of, of just that telework and being able to work remotely. Um, so I think that's going to be a big lasting change. We, uh, we have just a minute left. Um, any last comments? Any of the panelists really feel like they'd like to send off to students, something they feel like they didn't, message they didn't get to get out, feel free. Yeah, just, I mean, Mer Meredith, if you want to gather up these questions and you want to send us them in a document, um, I would be happy to share uh, and answer any perspective that I have there. I'm sure Michael and, and Karai and Laura might also, so that you could send, maybe send out as a follow-up. I don't want to leave anybody hanging. So I'm happy to do that as a, as a takeaway if, if you'd like. Same. Yes, yeah, great idea. Thank you. Yeah. Also, uh, afterwards, this will be posted on CW Career Services YouTube channel, and you can get there from the CW Career Services website. And uh, what I would say is there's just a lot of great um, information, even from the other ITAM panels, too. So um, for y'all that enjoyed this one, go back and look at the other ones, too, because a lot of students ask similar questions and you just get a wide variety of answers from different professionals this is great. So no, we're probably your favorite panelists. So far. absolutely. <laughs> I, I definitely laugh. No. I definitely laughed the most. No question. And uh, I still want to hear about those stories that you have to be drinking beer. To <laughs> I'm happy to share. <laughs> so, thank you so much for your time. We, we really appreciate it. And I do, I mean, I know Luke has said it and um, I'll say it too, is that, I hear great feedback from students later and they say, you know what I learned in the panel and um, students often make appointments with me afterwards because they get really excited about starting to work on their career and take the advice that you all um, gave. 
So cool. thank you. Thank yeah, you for the opportunity. Thanks, everybody. Likewise. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye-bye.